Imagine stepping into a world where the ordinary investing rules goes out the window and you get access to actually good investments out there, not that traditional investment garbage offered by your local broker or your 401k. What are the deals that the elite are doing? We tap into some of the secrets in this video that folks in Tiger 21, where you need $10 million, $30 million to get into. I'm going to be going into some charts about real estate deals and how that ties into the entire multiverse, if you want to call it, of private equity and venture capital and angel investing. If you are new to the channel, we work with high net worth investors who have high incomes and are definitely over one to two million dollars net worth and accredited investors. Uh, check out more of our content and join our club at thewealthelevator.com slash club. Tiger 21, if you aware of organizations such as EO or YPO. This is that next level above that where to join, you need to have a net worth of 10 or 30 million. I forget what it was exactly today, but you got some heavy hitters there, mostly business owners, because in my opinion, unless you're past the age of 60 and you've had those extra decade or two to have your money compound as a passive investor. It's really hard to get past eight figures, $10 million net worth, unless you've owned a business in your past. But either way, super wealthy people is the point. And if you break down their asset allocation mix, this is what it looks like. Big chunk of it is real estate. Next is private equity. It's essentially you need own businesses through a possibly through a syndicated form or you directly own it yourself or with a few of your buddies. So that's what private equity is. Public equities is your stocks, bond, mutual funds. Those are your traditional investments. And that's, this is where I wanted to introduce the vernacular of traditional versus alternative investments. So on the left side, you have traditional. On the right side of this chart here, you have alternatives. And this is th something I've always harped on, right? Traditional investments is all what we're taught to go into. And you want to move over to alternative investments, especially when your, your net worth is under five to $10 million. Number one, you get slightly better returns or a lot better returns. And we'll get into that here in the next slide. But essentially what we're talking about is public equities is your stocks, bond, mutual funds. These traditional investments, you're not going to get the passive losses if you're not investing through real estate or getting section 179 deductions there. If you're making over $300,000 a year, you really had to figure out how to implement real estate professional status reps and get that section 179 deductions from our tax pal fund. Check out the tax guide. I put a new video up at the top of the page there. It's a short video of that ATM fund slash the rep status strategy. Go to the wealth elevate slash tax for that tax guide there. But you want to be moving from traditional to alternative investments and also rounding out the other quadrant of the traditional investments in this ultra high net worth investor. You got some cash, maybe about 10%, some fixed income, hedge funds, commodities, miscellaneous in the single digits. Now, I think a big mistake people will look at, is these guys are carrying about 13% cash, but you also got to realize these guys are 10, $30 million net worth and above. So this may not represent what you should be doing at home, especially if your net worth is only one to $2 million. In my opinion, when you're lower net worth, you've got to have your cash deployed. It's got to be out, namely alternative investments. But this is just broken up into, all right, what applies to me? I'm not to 10 million, $30 million net worth and above. This isn't necessarily what you should do, but this is the data of what actually is happening out there. As you can see on the left side, you have the net worth of people under $500,000 net worth. What is their asset allocation mix holdings surrounding? And 62% is the primary residence. As you go from the net worth of under half a million dollars to half a million dollars to $10 million is the next transformation group there. And then you can call the $10 million net worth and above the more mature group. You can see how that principal residence goes from 60% to 26% to 8%. Now you can poke fun at my slide here and say, that's because their 
four million dollar house is obviously a lot smaller portion of their ten million dollar estate. Most people out there have maybe a million, two million dollar homes, and their net worth is one to two million dollars. So that makes a lot of sense. You can see where the the pension accounts is next big portion at seventeen percent, and then you can see the general trend from the alternative investments to the traditional investments are getting a lot bigger there. At that point, you can see how people are transitioning to traditional investments to alternatives. People ask all the time, what is a good rate of return? Anywhere from zero to 20% plus is per year is what you see out there for all kinds of deals. Now let's break it down. There's four levels to how your money is working for you. The first stage is your lazy money. This I think is what most of our parents or maybe even a lot of our colleagues out there who are pretty used to, which is zero to 4% returns. These are typically found in online savings accounts or your normal savings account or your credit union or even the rewards checking. You can also put T-bills in here where a lot of these are under that inflation rate of let's put it around three or 4%. These are poor returns. You want to get our money out of these types of arrangements. And what I'll also add in here, if you've owned your house for any number of years, your money is probably lazy money in your house. Do the math yourself. If you, maybe you put down 50 grand for your house several years ago, but today your equity in the house is $150,000. Calculate the rate of return on the 150000 It's likely putting that money in this lazy money category. Now, obviously, I think a lot of us who are on the call today realize we need to get our money working more than this lazy money threshold, perhaps in the normal money threshold from 5 to 8%. Previously, when I graduated college, I was brainwashed to put my money in stocks, bond, mutual funds, ETFs to get these so-called modest returns. And these are typically the returns. Maybe T-bills these days are touching the 5%, but that'll go away here in the next year or two, right? T-bills will go back into that lazy money mode along with the savings bonds and those types of investments. But we want to do better than this normal money. And that's where it transitions up from the sophisticated money and family office money type of deals to the solid returns and higher returns from there. And you can see where if you're paying attention to the coloring system here, normal money and lazy money is known to be more traditional investments. And when you break above that eight, nine, 10% rate of return and above per year, you're getting into these alternative investments. When you're in alternative investments, especially with real estate, you get these great tax benefits along the way. It's for you to even cut your tax rate by a quarter or a half, if you're able to do that little trick we do with the Section 179 losses and rep status, you're able to drive your income down to whatever you want, pay zero taxes legally, doing something like that. And for some people making $400,000 a year, $500,000 a year, you could save $100,000, $200,000 pretty easily right there. And, and that is on top of your returns on this. And that's why we say the trifecta to this whole wealth elevator is these deals, which is what we're talking about here on this slide. But then the second part, which for some people who are high income earners, it's the taxes. And then of course, a credit investor banking, infinite banking is the third part of the trifecta. But when you combo these three strategies together, it's an extremely powerful combination where you are able to get to where you want to be financially and, and get to these upper stratospheres that we've talked about on this first slide of getting to that $10 million net worth threshold and above. So what is sophisticated money? In 2000, I graduated college and I was stuck in this normal return money, the 6 to 8% in the mutual funds that Vanguard or Fidelity offered me. And it went up and down like a roller coaster. And then I bought a rental property and then realized like, wow, I'm making like 20 something percent return on my money. I'm not even like doing much work and effort. I'm not, wasn't even doing that high risk burr strategy. And if you guys don't trust me or if this is new to you, you can go to the wealth.com slash returns. I did a little whiteboard exercise where I broke down the four ways you make money through the real estate, which is cash flow, 
the tax savings, the fact that the tenant is paying down your mortgage for you, the equity buildup, and then the appreciation on the asset. And that's where I was able to get into these upper stratospheres. But I get it. Not everybody wants to flip houses or own rental properties directly, especially investors who are over $1 million net worth, where you really start to worry about the legal implications, right? I think that's where syndications and private placements came in for me. And I think it comes in for a lot of you guys out there who are worried about if there's a murder at the property or if somebody drowns in the pool or if a simple slip, trip or fall, or we've had it where there was a tenant sleeping in the roof and the roof caved in and then they wanted to put in a lawsuit. That stuff happens all the time. And that's where being a passive limited partner makes a lot of sense. Plus the debt is not getting in your own personal name. You're not the loan guarantor. The key principles within the general partnership are taking on that liability. As you move up on this threshold, you're probably asking, how do I get into these like 13, 14, even 20% plus returns on your money? And this puts you in the stratosphere that a lot of you guys listening may not be able to hit. This requires you to be more of an active investor and maybe get involved in developments or invest outside of the world of real estate. Now, in a way, real estate is in this stratosphere it's limited in terms of returns. I think that's why a lot of us are gravitated to real estate, the hard asset, and it doesn't fluctuate too much. Therefore, you've got to use some leverage and the banks give you great leverage on this asset class because of its stability. But there are other types of investments out there. If you're new to the wealth elevator, I would probably not even think about this stuff to invest in it until you've been in our group for maybe about a year or two. But I wanted to just put it on your radar. And this is essentially what this world looks like. See all those jumbled up circles in the bottom. So on this left side, you've got these lower risk types of investments. You see all those, they're all little circles to you guys. We'll, we'll dive into exactly that here in a little bit. But all those are in the world of real estate, the real estate hard assets. And now as you start to get into this other side, these are higher risk types of investments. With comes higher risk comes more reward. And in a way, and maybe this slide doesn't really depict this, but there's a bit of a asymmetric aspect to the more risk you take, typically the more returns you get. So if you see on the Y axis here on the left side, you can see where you're, these are more, more in talking in terms of equity multiples, not particularly percent returns. So a 2x equity multiple means 100% return. A 5x equity multiple, believe that's a that percent. I don't know what a 10x equity multiple, that's who cares? I've mean, made a boatload of money, right? But if you follow this chart, and I kind of place loosely, Bitcoin is a lot more of a risk than any real estate type of project. Even today, even with the ETFs and roads in place, it's still pretty risky. Not as risky as it was, it was like two or three years ago. You've got a ability to still make great returns in a short period of time. The next on the list is private equity, right? Investing in businesses. And this is a big world and a big range too. You could be investing in very stable type of businesses, lawyer businesses, engineering firms, different online SaaS businesses, things that are very stable, or it could be more venture-ish, more higher return, higher risk type of private equity. So that's a big world that I think a lot of folks, at least myself speaking, my first 10 years of investing, which was all in real estate, I wasn't aware of these different multiverses. And if people who have watched the Marvel movies, it's like the guys on Earth knew nothing about the folks in the movie Guardians of the Galaxy, right? But in a way, what we're doing here is we're combining the different heroes of the universe here and giving you a bigger picture. And that's been my whole passion with this Wealth Elevator project is ascend to that next floor, the next couple floors ahead and figure out what are the people that Initially, it was like, what are the people that are one to $10 million net worth doing? And I did that. I brought it back and it'll be in the, the new Wealth Elevator book. If you guys want to get access to that, you can go on Amazon. They're right. What are people who are even higher net worth? What are the folks that join Tiger 21 doing? 
in that 10 to $30 million range or the $50 million range and, and plus, or what we call in the Wealth Elevator book, the pet house and beyond, where you go up in your little Willy Wonka ch chocolate factory glass elevator and you shoot off to wherever you want, not to mention flying private jets and stuff like that. To continue on this chart, this is where you start to get into venture capital types of investments, VC deals, or you become an angel investor. Now, it's not for everybody. These types of deals, it's a very low rate of even getting your money back. It's often known as a crapshoot. Some people will say, at best, nine times out of 10, you lose your money. Or maybe one times out of 100, you hit something and it goes asymmetric and you make a boatload of money. Think of PayPal. Think of companies such as that. And of course, it's split up between small cap venture capital companies and large cap venture capital companies. The large cap being the ability to become a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar company or even a trillion dollar company. And then just for fun here, for those of you guys who are aware of Dogecoin, the little Shiba Inu coin that everybody makes fun of in internet memes, you might put that at the top there. I, I never give financial advice on these types of things, but I would be confident in saying, please don't invest in Dogecoin, or Dogecoin or what are people calling it these days? I call it Douchecoin because it's a stupid investment, if you ask me. It, it was meant to be a bit of a joke, even by the founders there. But if, if you're looking for a little bit of fun, check out some Dogecoin, D-O-D-G-O-D-E. I don't even know how to spell it. Go look it up for yourself. So again, what I'm doing here is we're going to zero in on that bottom left-hand portion where that all that stuff is jumbled up there. And like I said, this is in the world of real estate type of investments. So again, still the same risk reward matrix you have on the bottom, you have the lower risk stuff. And by myself here, you have the higher risk stuff here. And as you move up on the Y axis, you go from zero to 10 to 20 to 30%. These are about the normal annualized returns on these types of things people expect to see. The Y axis has changed slightly from that big picture. On this one, it was more equity multipliers, which is a lot bigger scale than what, what we have here from 0, 10, 20, 30%. If you're to extrapolate out where 100% a year would be at or a 2x equity multiplier, that would be off the chart here. So we're using a microscope and we're zeroing in very heavily here. Starting at the bottom left here, bonds, mar money market, you're making very low returns. And we talked about this on the last slide here. This, these, these things are your lazy money. You want to stop doing these types of traditional investments. REITs are just big institutional real estate investment funds where, again, the reason why we don't like these REITs and similar to mutual funds and other things here is there's a lot of bloat, a lot of hidden fees, a lot of times, and this is where we want to try and get away from. And this is where I introduce the line of you can do better, right? This is where I draw this arbitrary line of even if you're making higher returns with stocks, I think you can do better in the world of real estate. And then of course, private equity as we're coming up later. This is basically what most people have in their standard, their sad American 401k retirement diet. And just fun here, right by my head, you have lending money to families and friends. That's more of a high risk type of investment or I guess non-investment because a lot of times you don't get your money back or they never pay you back any type of interest. So let's get into more of the what we'll call the normal money and more of the sophisticated type of money that I think some of you guys are more interested in and maybe have done yourself. So we'll, st we'll start on this first level. A lot of people will start off in this world of they'll go to the local real estate meetup and they'll meet some house flippers and then money to the house flippers. And they might lend their money at in a, a first lien position or a type of position where their second lien that you might get a little bit higher rate of return. And the investors may also get into the world of investing in performing notes and non-performing notes, where non-performing notes are a little bit more riskier, but you get a slightly higher return. Another low risk effort is your day job. For a lot of folks, it is a rather low risk type of endeavor. Yeah, you could get fired, but really how many times has that happened over the last decade or two with pretty low risk? Just put that in there. It's not necessarily getting any type of return unless you see getting promotions down the road. 
I just put that in there as it's a little bit more of a lower risk type of endeavor because what's hard for a lot of new investors coming into the world of where they have to take ownership of their investment portfolio is to have a true understanding of risk. Like what does risk feel? And as I talk about in my book, in the conclusion chapter, a lot of this is we're trying to build a legacy. If the title of the book is for first generation multimillionaires, is we're the first generation going through this uncomfortable stage of investing in things that are outside the normal. And it doesn't take very long to get to where you want to be. And more than likely, if you set yourself up with a decade or two of doing this, with even if you're in your 50s, if you do that for a couple of decades in your 70s, you set your next offspring up to be in a pretty good state to inherit multi-million dollars of your estate. And the sad thing is that they don't have to know any of this. They don't have to understand and get comfortable with doing things that make them feel uncomfortable that are outside their little dotted line of uncertainty. And to draw another analogy, every, I think a lot of us have heard in a different context that the saying of get outside your comfort zone or amazing things happen outside your comfort zone. That's what that line of you can do better is essentially here. But moving out to the next stratosphere of investments, that I think a lot of us are familiar in the wealth elevator universe of real estate. You've got multifamily non-recourse syndications, turning rentals, you might get a little bit higher return there. But then this doesn't touch into the management headaches that you have with direct ownership of rentals or if you're self-dealing with your performing or non-performing notes. The idea is to combo your investments with the least amount of headaches and work yourself and of course, legal liability. And that's where multifamily value add Maybe developments is you get a little bit higher return there. For those business owners, you know, you guys, I would put that up top as a moderate risk. If it's your business, you know it intimately and you may feel like it's very low risk. Fair enough. Each to their own or your ideas is your realities. But for the most part, there is a huge range here, right? A lot of businesses go out of business. Sure, yours might be more mature, five years and older. But I just wanted to try to take a step at putting it on this matrix. It's obviously a little bit more risky than your average salary worker, especially working for the government. Although the salary worker could probably find another job in a few months, and so could you. So also keep that in mind there too. But I've talked to maybe thousands of you guys who booked that free onboarding call with myself. And we go over this and I still enjoy doing those. So if you guys are new to the community, Feel free to book that complimentary call with myself. But there's a couple of things that I've learned that I see as just like ultimate wealth building truths. The first thing is you cannot get to two, $3 million net worth by your 40th birthday, or for some of you guys, 50th birthday, unless you have crossed over that line of more than 50% of your assets in alternative investments. Basically, if you're investing in the normal stuff that we're all taught to, the stuff underneath the line of you can do better, it's very rare that I see people in that circumstance. The only exception other than you're a trust fund kid and your parents gave you a couple million dollars to start the race off with is you make a phenomenal salary, like half a million dollars, million dollars or greater. Some of the doctors are in this category. That's great for you. But as far as just looking at the data, looking at the thousands of people that come up and we look at your personal situation, it's just not going to happen. If you think you're going to get your net worth to over two, $3 million by the time you can actually still move around pretty well, maybe even hold your grandkids, you're smoking pot, right? <laughs> Unless you have crossed over that line of more than 50% of your assets in alternative investments, like it's not going to happen. The second part is you're not going to get to eight figures net worth in your lifetime unless you start early, like in investing in your 30s and maybe even 40s, and you start to implement this trifecta of strategies, which is alternative investments, saving money on taxes with these advanced strategies and a credit investor infinite banking strategies. That is unless you own your own business and you can get that business to at least half a million to million dollars of revenue. 
No, we're not talking about the little Boba Tea franchise or making a little online course on Udemy and making a few thousand dollars a year. We're talking about a more riskier and business that produces real seven figure plus revenue. Not to tell people like, hey, you can't do it, but I am, right? There is a sort of a glass ceiling for people. You're not going to get past $10 million net worth unless you have some type of business. That said, for most of our us in our community, my goal is to get you folks to four or five million dollars net worth by the time you can still pick up your grandchildren. For some of you guys are going to blast past that, right? Because you're starting in your 20s and 30s. But most of our clientele are in their mid 40s to early 50s. And that's, I'm, I'm talking about you guys. We want to get you to four or five million dollars net worth. Why? That way you can get out of alternative investments and get back to safer traditional investments and namely just put your money in lazy money type of investments or put your money in your life insurance, which gets you about 5% tax-free and off the table litigators. That's where we want to get you once you've crested up after three, four or $5 million net worth. You know, you're getting older. Let's be honest. You could pass away, unfortunately. I mean, you could go at 65, you could go at 75, which I, I would say for most guys out there, that's, that's probably not a bad life expectancy. But the thing is you could go and you could give this to your kids or your spouse, and they're not going to be as sophisticated with this type of stuff. To them, this is going to be like goobity and they're going to be like, what the heck was my husband or my wife doing on a Saturday, listening to this guy on YouTube or this webinar, or this podcast. Most of you guys listen to on the podcast, who is this guy my spouse is listening to as they're like very obediently washing the dishes, or at least that's what I do when I listen to my podcast, Not more audiobooks these days, but your spouse doesn't understand your crazy spreadsheets. It makes no sense to them, nor are they going to be able to be entrusted to invest your family's money into these alternative investments, namely on this upper level that we talked about here. Your family's wealth building ability generation mechanism is going to be going away if you were to unfortunately pass away. Now, how do you put this together, right? You build a portfolio of multiple holdings. One of the big rules I have is you never put more than five to 10% of your net worth into any one investment and you break it up. This is maybe about three, four years old, but at one time, to help people visualize all this, I made a chart with class A and class C assets and deals that were more yield play and were more heavy value add reposition deals. Although that's a bit arbitrary way of labeling these types of deals, but I tried to maybe double the amount of investments on here. So that's why I stopped because it just got to be ridiculous and it just became an arbitrary type of exercise here because the investment sizes started to increase and then it just became a mess. But for, for purposes of here, this is what a portfolio should be looking like, right? You diversify your assets into different types of holdings. You're in dozens and dozens of deals. I've always said a good way of starting out thinking about this is if you're thinking, all right, maybe I go into a private placement every quarter at $50,000, $100,000 a piece, just $100,000 to make math simple. All right, if I do four of those, because there's four quarters a year, that means I do $400,000 a year. And because most projects it typically last four, five years, right? Some are shorter, some are longer, but let's just say average five years because this is a generalization. If you put $400,000 into deals a year, and that's it's span over five years because you're expecting some of those deals to start to cash out at year five, then you've got $400,000 times five, you got $2 million of, in the game. And if you've got a net worth of $3 million, that's a pretty good asset allocation mix right there. And you're diversified. And as these deals start to exit out, you don't really have to worry about having enough passive activity losses on your 8582 form. It, it really works on to implement that lazy 1031 exchange. But I think the biggest thing that is daunting for people is, I'll get into kind of this chart here is, like all these types of investments, they're new to people. And here's the, the analogy I like to use is sushi. Now, not a lot of people eat sushi out there in the general public, but those who 
have friends who have tried it alongside of you, you'll trick your friend into going into the California roll. It's imitation crab, it's cooked, and typically it's pretty yummy because it's essentially a sugar cube. The imitation crab is mostly carbohydrates, not really healthy for you, but it's yummy. And you pass them the tempura roll, and then they like that because it's fried. But then you slip that spicy tuna in there, which is the first raw fish. And then they eat it and they're like, oh, this is good. And you say, hey, man, you just ate raw tuna. Congratulations. And they're begrudgingly, they're like, yeah, maybe I like this stuff. <laughs> That's like me, right? When I was buying little rental properties, I stepped up in, in this manner. And then I bought rental properties out of state by 2015, eventually having 11 of these little turnkey rentals all managed remotely. Of course, it became a bit of a headache, right? Accredited investors typically dump their single family home rental properties because of the legal liability and they're just not scalable. And then transition into more of, I guess this would be making like the raw tuna and the spicy tuna, which a lot of people who are new to sushi, they tend to like, right? And this is getting into this, the multifamily value add type of deals. And then you're off to the races. And for people who know their sushi, you get into ikura, which is very expensive. And don't give your kids ikura. I gave my daughter a piece and I, hopefully she doesn't like it because it's super expensive. But then you've got like the uni, which is the sea urchin that comes after. And yeah, now you're getting into the good stuff, which is also super expensive. Uh, you want to be careful if you're conscious about how much you spend. But then again, if you're investing in real estate or alternative investments, you probably don't even care. That's what life's for, to spend money on these types of indulgences. Originally, and this is me changing my mind over a thing, I had three rules of investing, things that produce cash flow, things that we're able to leverage, which is all these things on this chart, because these, this chart represents real estate primarily, things that are backed by hard assets, at least the alternative investments portion above the line of you can do better. And they're obviously all hard assets. And just a couple of notes there, gold, I'm not a huge fan of gold is mainly sold by people, influencers on you and bloggers that like to scare the crap out of you with fear porn, that the world's gonna end and you should use this affiliate link to buy gold. Maybe I should do that because you always have people out there who think that they should have five, 10% of their net worth in gold, but their net worth is super low. It's like under $5 million. I'm like, dude, you gotta have your money growing for you. Again, look at how the wealthy do it. They don't like gold for the high net worth people. It's like, 1% and they have the ability to have their money sit in hedge positions. You, on the other hand, need to get your money working. And sure, that may mean, mean getting out of your comfort zone and taking on more risk, but this is what you got to do with a portion of your portfolio. And that's up to you, whether that's one third, one half of your portfolio, or what I did when I first got started with this in my 20s and early 30s, I was 80, 90% of alternative. I think, yeah, it's actually even 100% alternative investments. And that's what got me to where I'm at. And that's why I'm so passionate about this stuff. But if it's just getting you to 50%, I think I've done my job. But rounding out these rules, cryptocurrency, what I don't like about it doesn't produce number one, which is cash flow, doesn't have any utility in society is my other big angst about it. And when you start to become a value investor, you need to have your investment rubric, you need to understand what resonates with you. And for me, cryptocurrency doesn't really resonate with me because what good is it? It's not like you even have a bag of coins I could hit somebody with. And at this point, there's not a really good safe way to get leverage on it. This is why we like real estate because think about it, because the banks vouch for it. The banks give great leverage on real estate. So this is that world that I was in for a long time. And up until a few years ago, I never really ventured outside of my comfort zone. But as I want to try and model for everybody, you have to constantly keep growing, right? That's what the growth mindset is. If you read that book, the whole concept of getting outside your comfort zone and keep pushing it. And that kind of brings me to, all right, we try and bust out of the real estate world, which is now it's zoomed out. You can't even read what it is now, but that's where you get into these other types of investment strategies and asset classes, more risk, but heck of a lot more return. So how do people balance this in their portfolio? It's all in the, the dosage here. And this is it labeled here. We have the traditional investments with the trash can emoji right there. 
the and then the real estate investments that are here, which normally around the institutional operators, maybe you're looking to double your money in 10 years. These are the guys who have higher splits and fees where you're not going to grow your money super aggressively. Most good operators that the trouble is like figuring out who are the fake it to you make it operators under $1 billion of assets under ownership and who are more the middle market operators. That's a little bit more of the harder part. And what we're going to be doing for those of you guys who are interested in joining our family office, Ohana Mastermind Group, we're going to be ingrained more these days into we've been analyzing different passive investing deals. For a lot of you guys have access to the syndication LP e-course. If you haven't yet, go to, or just shoot our team an email. We have the new portal set up. Most takes most people eight to 10 hours to go through. We're, no, we're not charging that for $3,000, $4,000 to get access to that. We're just giving that away. Most people, when they go to that course, they know more than most accredited investors out there. To be quite honest, most accredited investors are not super sophisticated, but when say do become higher net worth. They actually employ professional underwriters and real estate people on their behalf to help them make the right decisions. But unfortunately, a lot of you guys aren't there yet. You're not to 10 to $30 million net worth to get these people on your payroll quite yet. So this is the hardest part. And this is why I like to help people who are in this difficult position. As I was in 2000, when I made the switch, sure, I knew single family homes and I knew how to dance with real estate, but I was out of my element investing in this world of private placements and syndications with all these operators who I didn't know who was trustworthy and who were just good marketers. And as I've chronicled a lot of times, lost money. The first time, the article, if you want to read into the details, that's thewealthelevator.com slash fail. I lost 40 grand on that. And I didn't know what I knew now, but the more important thing, I didn't have a community and a network around me at the time. But over the last, and we started the group back in 2018, we have that community. Of course, you're going to have to pay to play, right? Um, if you're interested in that community, go to thewell.com slash F-O-M, which stands for the Family Office Ohana Mastermind. But we're going to be taking a look at deals a, a lot more in detail there. And of course, that's all through confidentiality and kind of behind closed doors. Um, if not, the syndication LPE course, that's the free method right there, but you're on your own in terms of vetting your own deals to invest in. Once you've gotten comfortable into real estate deals and you may want to take a swing at a home run once in a while, and that's where you move off to these different types of investments. Something that I've seen from myself and a lot of people who I started investing with back in the day, they don't leave real estate. They still have real estate as a you know, majority of their alternative investment portfolio, but they eventually, they, they definitely do branch out. And for a lot of these people, again, just to set, set the expectations, alternative investment portfolio is more than half of their traditional investment portfolio. And again, if you're under two to $3 million net worth, I think your portfolio needs to be even more slighted towards alternative investments. And again, like I said, like with my portfolio, when I was in my 20s and now I'm, I guess I'm exiting my 30s, it was majority of it, vast majority alternative investments. Now, this may mean for a lot of you guys who were good Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts who listen to all the directions, put a lot into your 401k, which is just the way that they handcuff you to go into traditional investments. You may need to crack open that million, million and a half in your 401k that's trapped in the public equities and get it out. I think maybe in a future office hours, we'll talk more about, does it make sense to have any type of IRA, self-directed IRA, solo 401k, or any QRP, qualified retirement plan 